So last time, assuming that I've uploaded all the videos in the correct order, because I've just been banking videos so I can take a little bit of a break, I took a look at the MP412's fiddle brake that was basically a second brake pedal, something that got exposed by F1 Racing Magazine in the September-October of 1997. And there were three reasons as to why it was cool. Number one is that it was cheap. It cost McLaren just £50 to make it, and it was made out of spare parts they just had lying around. It was another brake cylinder, some tubing, and a pedal to activate it. There might have been a couple more bits, but at its core it was essentially three main parts. Secondly, it annoyed everybody, and that's always fun because it is amazing seeing everybody squirm when somebody comes up with something that they didn't. The third thing is, it worked. McLaren was said to have gained half a second just from the brake pedal alone, and then when Nui joined the team, the cars were unstoppable over the first two rounds of the 1998 season after which a protest from Ferrari saw the second brake pedal get banned. That 1998 McLaren is one of my favourite Formula 1 cars it has to be said, and it was just a simple trick, and actually I should have called the video other F1 teams hate him because of this one simple trick, but when you look at something as simple and genius as the fiddle brake, you look at the stuff that's happened within the last five or six years, there doesn't seem to be that much innovation anymore. Is that something you can agree with? Because the FIA in recent times has gone on a mission to close as many loopholes as possible. They're waiting until 2026 to close the aero outwash loophole, something I didn't know about until I tried searching for the supposed FIA team that's reading the rulebook and trying to get rid of all the holes that will allow for some tricks, as well as closing loopholes that allow for teams to outsource stuff to dodge the cost caps. They're closing loopholes that fall into the realms of okay, you might have a point, and in some other cases it's the realms of, oh, cool, you're making this almost a spec series. But in 2020, during one of Formula 1's most, well, messed up seasons, there was something that appeared on one of the cars that astounded people, interested people, and disgusted people in equal measure. During testing in the February of 2020, people were amazed to see Lewis Hamilton's steering wheel being pulled back as if he was a 747 pilot on takeoff from Heathrow Airport. Some thought that the steering was broken, some thought it was some sort of weird hydraulic system that changed the angle of the wings, some thought it was some sort of triple or quadruple DRS system, and some thought it was absolutely mental. But it was only one of those things. Mental. It was one of the big talking points of pre-season testing in 2020, and the only thing anybody could agree on as to what was to call this system, what it did, and ultimately, was it legal? Because in the past we've seen some subtle things that have come out and left people baffled. Take the second brake pedal that I looked at last time on the channel. The other teams and the F1 media had an inkling for most of the season that McLaren was up to something, but no noise was made because whatever McLaren was doing, it wasn't too obvious. It wasn't until Darren Heath noticed the brake disc glowing on corner exit that it became apparent that McLaren was doing something with the brakes. Using it as a form of traction control maybe? Because why else would they glow in the acceleration zone? So, like already mentioned, when Darren Heath's photographs appeared in the September or October 1997 issue of F1 Racing Magazine, the other teams lost their collective minds. They were saying things like, how am I going to develop my own? How much will that cost if I develop my own? Is it safe? Is it legal? What does it actually do? I'm going to Charlie Whiting. Actually, screw that, I'm going straight to Max. The same thing happened with the blown diffusers and the F-duct. These were subtle innovations that worked in such a way that it meant that the teams around the one team doing it were looking and being suspicious that something was up, because whatever those things were, it gained that team an advantage. A big one in the case of blown diffusers. But by the time the other teams had cotton on to what it is and how it works, they're already way behind, and the original team's advantage is locked in. In the case of the blown diffuser, Nui had already been to Renault and asked about blowing the gases off throttle. The blown diffuser was actually being used in the early 90s, but the gases blew on throttle only instead. So under braking there would be a bit of a downforce loss and the cars would be a little bit twitchy under braking. Nui and Renault had worked out how to blow on and off throttle for maximum blow over the diffuser, which resulted in much better rear end grip off throttle, and less rear wing drag because now the diffusers were taking over more of the load. How it screwed the other teams is that McLaren, Ferrari, Mercedes and so on were now having to build cars that weren't designed for these blown diffusers. Red Bull had built their car around the blown diffuser, they knew what they were doing, the other teams had to shoehorn it in, and the same thing happened when the other teams tried to run their own F-ducts in 2010. 
The difference is with Mercedes, this thing was so blatantly obvious, it was like they were driving around with a massive neon sign towed behind them, saying, Hey, check this out. This is cool. We're doing a thing. Hey, hey, Christian. Christian, you annoyed yet? <laughs> Cargo brrr, or words to that effect. But the question still remained. What the hell was this thing, and why was Mercedes showing it off to the world like that? Okay, maybe they didn't actually say, Hey, look at this! It was just caught by one of the roll hoop cameras. What it was, was a way of getting around a problem that Mercedes thought the 2020 car was going to have. Not had, but might have. So to explain some of this, we need to look at some of the stuff that makes up part of the setup of an F1 car, particularly around the wheels and suspension. Two things that the teams will run will be toe and camber, and these have two noticeable effects on the setup. The first we'll look at, because it's the most simple one, is camber. This is the tilt of the wheels, put in a simple manner. If the tyres are sitting square to the road surface, you have neutral camber. If the tyres fold inwards slightly, you have negative camber, and if they go outwards, you have positive camber. What this does is that it allows for the contact patch of the tyre to be spread evenly through the corners for better grip, and there can be less rolling resistance in a straight line. This is because while in a straight line there's going to be less tyre on the road because you've got the tyres pointing inwards or outwards as the case may be. But as with everything else when it comes to car setup, for every advantage there's a disadvantage. Too much negative or positive camber and you'll get less rolling resistance in a straight line, but you won't have as much on the road in the braking zone. Basically, you want the loads as equally balanced between the straights and the corners. There's probably some sim racing setup guru out there that will probably want to explain everything in the finest details, but while I'm happy that you know everything there is to know about this sort of thing, 99.7% of my audience probably doesn't. So we're going with the simple way of explaining things. The next thing is toe. For want of a better description, if camber is this, toe is that, if you follow me. I, I probably look really stupid right now, don't I? Toe in is the wheels pointing across each other. Toe out has them pointing away, and while making car setups, the teams will alter the toe to suit. Toe in on the rear causes understeer, which can help with cars that want to kick the tail out on corner exit, but on the flip side, you get increased heat on those tyres. If you add more toe in to the front, the car will want to understeer on turn in. Toe out will make it want to oversteer on turn in. With the toe in, or out for that matter, you will get a little bit of scrub across the road because, as you've probably gathered, the wheel isn't straight, so it scrubs against the ground while in a straight line. It's generating a little bit of heat, which is useful because racing tyres have an operating window with which to work in. Mercedes was worried about generating tyre heat. They were worried that their car was going to be too gentle on its tyres, something that, despite Formula 1 almost being a tyre saving series much like Group C was a fuel efficiency series, is a bad thing. If you're not generating tyre temperature, you're not going to get the grip, and this is going to seriously hurt in qualifying at tracks like Monaco where it's incredibly difficult to get the tyres up, and something that Mercedes had encountered issues with before, and you also get graining and bits and pieces like that. So long story short, Mercedes devised a system where they could basically run the toe that they needed to help generate the heat for turn-in and bits and pieces like that without any of the drawbacks. The way it worked is that Hamilton and Bottas pressed a button on the back of the steering wheel and were then able to pull the wheel towards them. As they did so, the toe angle at the front of the Mercedes W10 went more neutral, decreasing scrub and improving straight line speed. Mercedes would then set the car up with two toe angles, one for generating the heat required and for going through the corners, and one for the straights. The way Hamilton and Bottas used it was that they would have the wheel pulled towards them on the straights, and this allowed for a more neutral toe angle and improved straight line speed. And as they went into the braking zone, the wheel went forward, increasing the toe out and that caused more scrub, which in turn generates more heat, grip and helps with braking, and also has the toe required to have the proper handling in the corners. Basically, teams have to find that balance between corner handling and straight line rolling resistance, but Mercedes could have both. On an outlap, formation lap, or before the safety car restart, they could run the more toe out option and generate the heat that they needed. Then, when the race restarts or they go on their flying lap, the pulling back of the wheel on the straights to zero out the toe will mean that the tyres weren't being unnecessarily scrubbed in a straight line, increasing tyre life by about a lap by best estimates. 
So without this system called dual axis steering, or just DAS for short, they would have to run that very tight balance between rolling resistance and cornering stability and all of that other stuff, which might mean, like other previous Mercedes cars, having a very narrow setup window. With DAS, they could only use more towing when they absolutely had to. But the big question was, was it legal? Formula One in 2020, as already mentioned, was a bit all over the place. After testing, the sport went on pause much like everything else did as races were cancelled left, right and centre. So it wouldn't be until four months later when they arrived at the Red Bull Ring where we were going to see how this thing was going to work over the course of a Grand Prix. But the discourse had already started prior to this. Red Bull had planned to protest this system at the cancelled Australian Grand Prix if Mercedes ran it. Articles from the time didn't know exactly what Red Bull would have protested it under, but it was evident that Christian Horner was wanting at least some sort of clarification as to whether this thing was legal or not. At the first official round of that 2020 season in Austria, Horner and Red Bull finally lodged an official complaint. They protested under Article 3.8 of the Technical Regulations, which refers to all things aerodynamic, and then Article 10.2.3 that states that no adjustment can be made to the suspension systems while the vehicle is in motion, which is essentially the anti-active suspension rule. The protest came after Hamilton and Bottas had finished 1-2 in both the Friday practice sessions and they had run DAS through those two sessions. Red Bull sought clarification on the system, whether it was legal, and if it was, then they might consider making their own version. The FIA ruled the system legal and dismissed the Red Bull protest, as well as the other protests that had been filed by other teams, so it wasn't just Red Bull that had a problem with this thing, or at least just wanted clarification on this particular thing. It later emerged that Mercedes had been talking to the FIA about how best to run this system to make sure it was totally legal, and then Bottas admitted that he'd known about this thing for well over a year. Bottas said, I've been aware of it for quite a long time, as it was not a quick project. The first time I heard about it was something like one year ago. It's very nice to be in a team that comes up with this kind of system. It tells something about the great minds our team has, and it's not an easy thing to start to design and make work. We are still learning a lot about it and developing its potential, but I think sometimes, in certain circumstances, it can be pretty good. But that will be shown later on in the year, in different conditions, different tracks, how it can help us, if it can but it's quite impressive and it has been working fine. Others weren't so confident in DAS's ability to help Mercedes out. Vettel said it must be like running in flip-flops with all the pushing and pulling and trying to do everything else that you have to do in a Formula 1 car, but Bottas was quite confident that the system was safe and easy to use. The only other team to attempt something similar was Ferrari. They ran something called PAS, or Power Assisted Steering, during 2020, and this is thought to be a version of what Mercedes had tried a couple of years before with what later became the DAS system. Mercedes had already run something prior to DAS about two years before having DAS. But what the PAS system was designed to do was to work in such a manner that it enabled one wheel to turn more than the other into a corner, depending on how much steering lock was put in. Ferrari was happy enough with PASS to be able to give it to Haas later on in the 2020 season, but they ran this despite the FIA saying that yes, DAS is legal, but from 2021 onwards, you won't be allowed to use it anymore. But while question marks surrounded the device, the other team bosses seemed to be full of praise for the system. The thing was, were the other teams going to have to try and build their own versions of DAS? Especially with the FIA saying not long after they threw out Red Bull's protest, it would be banned for 2021. What would the short-term gains have been for a team making one of their own? What would it have cost them? Was it going to be worth it given how already shaken up the 2020 season was going to be? And it makes sense as to why it was later banned for 2021. With the cost caps coming in and the sport in general being shafted by the pandemic, it would have meant some teams over-engineering and maybe overspending when it came to their own. A team might have come up with their own DAS systems and they might have been a tad more complicated than the Mercedes system was and that might lead to safety concerns. See some drivers removing their hands from the steering wheel to use the F-duct in the latter parts of the 2010 season. It's difficult to see how much of a gain DAS was. Maybe in a season that wasn't as chaotic as 2020 it might be easier to see how much of a helping hand it might have been because things were just so all over the place. I think most of the teams were just trying to just get through. That said, Mercedes won 13 of the 17 rounds of the season and Hamilton romped to a 7th world title. It could just be that Mercedes would have been as dominant without DAS as with it. 
but it remains an interesting, innovative and above all else controversial system. There are still comments complaining about it being posted online. There's probably going to be comments complaining about it here, but it does make you wonder that if it was somebody else that had come up with it, it wouldn't be so bad. Mercedes had been utterly dominant, so something else that gave them an edge was probably going to be met with seething and the inability to cope. There will be those that hate it because it broke a rule. Some might hate it just because it was Hamilton that benefited from having this particular system when he'd already been so dominant. And there might be others that hate it because they think it's a stupid system. But I think it might be the last true great innovation in Formula One. You might have hated the system, but still, maybe give credit where credit is due for it because it was mind boggling. Everybody's mind was blown by this thing. But I'd like to know what you think about it. So then, a look at the innovative, interesting, mesmerising and controversial dual-axis steering system that Mercedes had during the all-over-the-place 2020 season. If this has clarified some bits and pieces for you, allowed you to kind of understand things and also been an interesting video at the same time, do like the video so I know a good job was done. And for more stuff like this, get subscribed and also get that bell on so you never miss out on anything else I do around here. Massive thanks as ever to the rad lads at Patreon that continue to support me at a more personal level. And if you want to help keep things running around here, then a link to Patreon is in the description, along with links to Discord, socials, and other bits and bobs you might want or need to know, along with my affiliate links. There's also super thanks for the one and done donations, and there's memberships there too if you just want a Patreon alternative. So until next time, I've been Aidan Mord, have a great day wherever you are, and goodbye. Thank you.